If you're an ENFP and you've struggled to explain your way of being to friends or family in your life, perhaps those who are wired to be quite different, such as ESTJs, then this video is for you. And by you, I actually mean to share with them. So now I'm going to be speaking to them. Now, if you're watching this, it's because an ENFP in your life feels like you don't exactly understand what it's like to be them. And because of that, are putting the wrong kind of pressure or judgment on them. Now, first things first, if you're watching this, there's a good chance you're wired to be more, I need science, I need evidence. What is this Myers-Briggs 16 personality stuff? It's not scientifically validated. And there's some truth to that. So we're actually not gonna talk about the 16 personalities. We're gonna talk about the big five, which is a very scientifically validated system. And there are actually three spectrums on the big five, all scientifically validated, we're going to discuss openness, conscientiousness, and agreeableness. And we're gonna discuss how you are probably wired differently on two or three of those than the ENFP who sent you this video and why it is so fundamental and unchangeable in terms of someone's personality and how it changes how they interact with the world. If you're someone who's really good at being consistent, I mean, you might not see yourself as kind of consistent and boring and doing the same things quite repetitively, but if we're honest with each other, that's more how you live. You probably looked at this ENFP in your life and thought, why can't you just stick to one thing? Why are you changing routines all the time? Why are you changing jobs all the time? Can't you just stick to one thing? And the truth is we can't. And you might think that's ridiculous. All sticking to one thing is, is just making a decision and doing the same thing. But the truth is it's not. Your ability to just stay within a very structured routine or life is related to conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is something that is hardwired into us. You might be high conscientiousness, which means that you are probably quite hardworking and that you like structure. You like things to relatively stay the same. You might pretend you're being adventurous. Like when you go on that trip to Hawaii, you rent a Mustang convertible and you're like, look at me, I'm so adventurous, but really, you know, but if we're really being honest with each other, you like, and there's nothing wrong with this, very structured, somewhat predictable life. That is what makes you happy. And that is actually what you need and end up creating. Now on the flip side of that, people who are low in conscientiousness don't really like structure. We don't like things to be fixed. Now, those of us who are low in conscientiousness, it might seem at first like a character flaw, like, wait, you don't like structure and you're not good at hard work, but actually it serves a huge purpose. Think about how ever changing this world we are. And even in the last six months, how much things have changed. People who are very high in the need for structure don't tend to do very well at adapting and being flexible in times of change. So if you're high in conscientiousness, you're great at creating systems at maintaining things that work really well. Without you, our societies would fall apart. There is no doubt about that. But when things are changing, whether it's the environment, whether it's the political stage, whether it's technology, it's the people who are actually low in conscientiousness and can be very adaptable and creative who can see that change and function really well in that ever-changing environment. I need to be clear as well, this is not a choice. I used the term earlier, we don't like a lot of structure. It's not really about liking, it's almost how just how our mind is wired, how we function. And it can be easy on the outside to look and say, well, why can't you just be more structured? Why can't you just have that? But let me turn that question around on you, right? Now, are you someone who likes public speaking? If you don't like public speaking, getting in front of a large crowd, or maybe walking around a room and, and smoothing everyone, networking, connecting with 50 people, being that kind of politician, lovable person. If that isn't you, why can't you just do it? There's people, why can't you just get on stage and talk to people? Who cares if there's 10,000 or five or one? Isn't it just the same? You're just moving your mouth. Why is that a big deal? Why does that not work for you? If you don't love networking and walking around a room, shaking hands with hundreds of people and trying to get along with everyone, why not? Isn't that like a basic human thing? Like as a child, you learn how to get along with people. Can't you just shake hands and smile and say nice things? That's again, you have a mouth, you know how to function, you know how to smile. Why can't you do this? Maybe you're someone who always needs to be really busy and productive and in control. 
the unknown scares you. Now you won't admit the unknown scares you, right? You'll never say, hey, I, I need to have control of everything because really I'm quite anxious and I'm worried if I don't control things that they'll just spiral and who knows what could happen. Don't worry, I won't tell anybody that that's the truth. Now you might say to me that, yeah, being afraid of the unknown and wanting to have control, there's an evolutionary basis for that, right? It serves a purpose to want to always have a plan, to want to always be in control, to have structure that prevents bad things from happening. The unknown should be scary. The unknown could have lions or tigers in the darkness. Don't go out there. Yeah, that's definitely true. That does serve a purpose and that is completely accurate. But when we look at human history, I mean, how much change are our species? And if we want to include the monkeys in this as well, going even further back, we had a lot of change. We had ice ages. We had dinosaurs and giant snakes eating us and all kinds of conflict between our species and things were always changing. And don't you think someone who was comfortable with the unknown, who could just give up control and be laid back and just go along with what was happening and then find solutions as they had to come up, don't you think that would serve a big evolutionary purpose? There's plenty of Fortune 500 companies that were very well structured and very disciplined and did not have enough people who were unstructured and creative who crashed and burned in the 90s and 2000s when technology changes and when consumer preferences changed. There were plenty of companies who burned the same way people who were really set in their ways probably froze to death during the ice age when they weren't willing to make some kind of a life change and adapt to the changing environment. My point is that what you may see as our weaknesses or challenges are only that in your worldview. That if you look at the holistic worldview, our weaknesses are actually our strengths and there's an evolutionary reason that we have them. We would not have them if they did not serve a purpose. Evolution is not stupid. There is a reason that we are wired this way. And it may not always be perfect in the environment we're in, in our society, even in our time in history. We might have been born in the wrong time, although I actually think this is our time, especially coming up when we're gonna really thrive. But heck, we might even not be that useful in an entire century. Although personally, I think this is really going to be our century and maybe make a video about that in the future. The thing is, these traits serve a purpose. Being low in conscientiousness, yes, it means we're a bit messy and we're maybe not as hardworking, but it also means that we're extremely creative and that we're extremely adaptable and we come up with lots of new solutions. Being high in openness means that we like to learn new things and yes, sometimes we get bored with repetition. We don't love doing the same thing over and over again. And if we're low in conscientiousness, it also means that we're not going to be able to force ourselves to keep doing that thing. But guess what being high in openness also means? It means we learn things really fast. It means on average, we have a lot higher IQ and you might've heard of IQ, it's kind of an important thing. So it does serve a bit of a purpose there as well. And then there's the third spectrum that I wanted to touch on, which is agreeableness. Agreeableness is basically how it sounds. It's not a complicated term. You don't have to be high in openness to know what agreeableness means. Agreeableness is whether you're going to let things slide and adapt to get along with people or whether you have to be right and you have to be really competitive. People who are high in agreeableness are less competitive and we are less argumentative. There's some serious downsides to this. It means in the workplace, we often won't push for something that we really want. It means that we're less competitive, as I said, which can have financial consequences, but it also means we're a lot less likely to die alone that we're gonna have a wide network of friends and relationships and people we've connected with over the years. And if you look at the research on longevity and life happiness, relationships and people is right up there at the top. So do you think there's a purpose to being really agreeable? I think there definitely is. And if it means earning 10% less every year, but having a wide range of people who love you and great friends, well, I don't know. You can decide on that. You can do some calculations on what it's really worth. My point here is not that one is necessarily better than the other. Although of course I always got to argue for my fellow ENFPs. My point is that the way we are wired does serve a purpose. And this ENFP who sent you this video, what you can do to really support them is understand what they do really well. Really comprehend 
their strengths and how they approach things differently than you. Knowing that because they are high in agreeableness, they have a wide network of friends, but it also means that negotiation or conflict is really tough for them. And they feel the same kind of apprehension or anxiety that you might feel walking into the unknown and having absolutely no control. And so it's much harder for them than it is for you. So when they say, I don't wanna have that tough conversation, it's not because they're trying to be difficult or they're weak or anything else. It's just because for them, it is actually in their body, biologically, 10, 20, 30 times harder to have that conversation than it might be for you. So when you understand that, then you can better support them to create the kind of life that they really wanna have and that I'm sure you would really like them to have as well. So let's leave it there. If you are new to the channel, my name is Dan. I am a coach. I work specifically with ENFPs and other idealist types. I also publish new videos here on YouTube each and every week, helping you become the best version of yourself and create an awesome life for you and those you love. So if you are an ENFP, you should definitely have hit the subscribe button by now. And if you're not, but you'd like to keep learning now about the ENFP in your life who perhaps shared this video with you, then uh, hit that subscribe button and check out some of the other videos to deepen that understanding. I also offer a free training program for ENFPs, including a very uplifting pep talk. You can go to dreamsaroundtheworld.com forward slash ENFP training. I'll include that link in the description and as a card as well, and you can check that out. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video soon.